Today, we explore the dawn of the artificial intelligence era. Don't focus on the tech, focus on what is it you're trying to improve. Discover with experts David Walters and Martin Sutton how small businesses can now access AI as Walter explains. The democratization of artificial intelligence. Hear Sutton's advice to Embrace this. AI is not going to disappear. Will AI threaten jobs? There's a recalibration of the way that people work, which potentially will have an impact on jobs. Tune in to World Chronicles as they reveal how to capitalize on AI's transformative potential. Hit the like button, subscribe, and let's get into the conversation. We're at the dawn of the artificial intelligence era. Uh, and in this episode of Wealth Chronicles, we are going to be looking at the seismic changes that AI promises across industries, investments, and careers. And to help us get an understanding of the subject matter, we have David Walters and Martin Sutton from River Capital to help us understand this subject. So to start off, David, could you just give us an understanding of what is AI and what does it mean to the average person? Sure. Um, well, AI has been around since the 1940s. And uh, if you were to sort of read the press recently, you think it's just been invented with ChatGPT mm. and OpenAI. But the way I think about AI is it's all about the data. So lots of organizations have a lot of data sitting within their businesses. And what AI helps them to do is to be able to automate processes, to be able to make recommendations to, um, to their customers. It might be to create driverless cars, but at the heart of it is, is, is data. And then when you've got a lot of data, um, the way that you're able to go on those sort of artificial intelligence journeys is by using things like machine learning, uh, by employing data scientists, by doing statistical analysis of those data sets and creating algorithms. And the heart of artificial intelligence are algorithms. Machines have learned how to interpret data to, inter to, to be able to interpret what's happening with the information that comes into these algorithms and to make decisions. But data is at the heart of everything. So what is the change if the technology has been existing for a number of years? Why is there a frenzy? Why is everyone talking about it as if it's something new? It's around data processing. So supercomputers over the last five to 10 years have revolutionized what you can do with data. You're now able across platforms like AWS and Azure to process terabytes of data in instant seconds and to be able to make decisions which three, four, five, ten years ago were just impossible to make. The computing power wasn't there. So the supercomputing capability that is now available to any business on the planet has turbocharged artificial intelligence and the ability to make decisions from data. Now, to just kind of set a backdrop on this, since you mentioned that this has been in existence for a number of years, uh, we're filming here in Liverpool and in the 1800s, if I would have gone outside, the roads would have been full of uh, horses and carts. And within a few decades, all of that was swept away by the introduction of the automobile. And from that went along all the supporting industries from the cart makers to the street sweepers. It feels like we are on the urge of something similar, if not greater. What do you think in terms of modern, in terms of real life actionable solutions and changes that you're seeing in our everyday life, but also in industries? What is actually happening out there that people can actually say, hold on a minute, let's take note. The yeah. horses are going and the automobile is coming. I, I love your analogy of, mm. uh, of horses, actually, because mm. something that uh, always springs to mind when you mention horses and you mention sort of like revolutions, mm. and you can think of this as like a fourth industrial revolution. But if we just flip back to the car for a second before sure. I answer your question on, on the, the, the AI question you posed, is um, if you go back to Henry Ford at the invention of the Ford motor car when everything was sort of horse-driven that you just alluded to, yeah. and, and he basically said, like, people will always fear change because change is uncertain. <laughs> And if you ask people what they really want, they would have asked for faster horses, not cars. And it's a quote I really, really love. And I think we're, we're going into a similar era with AI that there's, a lot of people are very uncertain about what it looks like and what it feels like. So they're a little bit resistant to change. But to come back to your, your original question, which was like, what have we seen now that we can sort of point to and, and sort of demonstrate that it's changing life for good? I guess we look at two examples. If we look at how it affects us personally in our own lives, um, like who would have thought 
even five years ago that you would have an AI assistant in your home called Alexa, and you'd be able to ask this, this, this device in your house for a multitude of things, such as what's the weather like, play me my favorite playlist, wake me up in the morning, where are my kids? So we're starting to interact, like we're coexisting seamlessly with AI in our own lifestyle, in our own homes. From like a, a business perspective, there's an interesting stat I, I really like that traditional businesses, and we pick a, look at retail, for example, so that retail has been around forever. Those businesses that have, that have sort of um, embraced AI and have brought it into their business to do things like serve their customers better or understand their supply chain better are actually growing um, uh, at 30% faster than the non-AI savvy peers with a 50% greater profit margin. So there's two sides to that coin. Businesses that are adopting are seeing, seeing growth potential and, and as selves, as humans in everyday life, we're, we're getting like enhanced experiences and getting some of what I would describe like the drudgery taken away from tasks and things that we have to perform ourselves. AI is now able to help us. Okay, so how do I then position myself as a SME business owner to to be able to take advantage of this new technology? Because sometimes when you listen and hear what is being done out there in terms of the proprietors of the technology, it seems like there's a lot of investment going in yep. for you to develop a customized model for your own particular uh, use case can be very daunting um, and can be very taxing uh, for yep. as, a, as an R&D investment. So what am I doing as an SME yep. while I'm seeing the big firms seeming to put all the millions that they have on their uh, you know, in their in their accounts towards this. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, we, we use this term the democratization of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Martin and I have both worked in and ran um, businesses who who are able to help small businesses go on these journeys. So you can you can waste a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort, a lot of energy, a lot of lot of lot of strategy by going down the wrong choices, the wrong technology choices, hiring the wrong people. And the, the types of businesses that we've worked in and run in the past are actually helping companies to make those choices. So sometimes it's a good idea to outsource okay. employing data scientists, for, for, for example. Data scientists can be quite expensive. They like to work in packs. Uh, they like to share ideas with each other. They like to have the shiniest tin. <laughs> and you know, if, if you're a paper mill in, um, in the north of England and you want to go on a data science journey, it's sometimes quite difficult to keep data scientists happy. So um, our approach in the past has always been to look to, as you start that journey, to potentially use some outsource partners to help you on that bit, to work out the best approach for your company, and then to start to put flesh on the skeleton of the data journey that you're actually building out. Um, but again, this sort of democratization of artificial intelligence is, I mean, we've all heard of chat GPT, right? Yes. You know, you can sort of Google, um, uh, whatever you want and find an, and find an answer for it now because of, because of GPT. Uh, it's the same if you're a video gaming company, for example, you can, you can now start to use open AI to create your graphical gamescapes. And we've got companies in our portfolio that, that are, that, 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 that are doing that. So there's very definitely, a um, uh, an ease of deployment um, activity taking place. But I, 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 I don't know what you think, Martin. I think making sure you make the right decisions right at the start of those projects is key. Yeah, just to add to that, I, I think um, a lot of people get blindsided by the tech, right? Because AI is yep. kind of like cool sounding and people are like, oh, AI, I want, do I want deep learning, machine learning? They get, they get too focused on the types of technology that AI can provide. And that's where you will fail. Like the, the, the first thing we would always recommend is try and just figure out what you're trying to do. Sounds really simple, but like, what is the problem you're trying to fix? And how, how is AI and is AI going to be able to allow you to fix that problem faster? Yeah. Really simple. Sounds really simple. And then work backwards from that. Like what sort of technologies do we need to actually speed up those processes or delight our customers better? Is AI fit for purpose versus going straight into the tech? Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a stat, isn't there, that... Um, that I think Gartner and people throw around that a lot of like data related projects fail to deliver a return on investment. And it's because people go straight into tech mode versus yeah. let's solve the problem and let's apply the tech backwards underneath the, underneath the counter sort of thing. That's key, isn't it? It's, it, you know, whenever, whenever Martin and I have looked at, looked at AI projects for cut for, for, for our clients, that's always been the recommendation. What's yeah. your business problem? Yeah. What are you trying to fix? 
And then there's an iterative process that the data scientists and the mathematicians go through to work out, you know, what, what kind of algorithm do I need to apply to this, to this problem? Which one operates the most effectively? I mean, it's, it comes back to that, what is the business problem? Okay. And then how can you use data in order to fix that business problem? And it could take three, four, five, six weeks to work out the best way to do it. It's never about tech first. It's always about the business. So w w let's talk about the business then in terms of what type of business is this realistic for? I mean, you, you have third party applications that one can look at and embed within their operating system. Yep. But in terms of customization, let's put it as plain as simple as the days when the websites were coming. You know, once everyone got to the understanding that, okay, a website can be developed. Yes, you can develop it for 1 million, but also you can actually just develop it for 500 pounds and get up and going. Yeah. And also on the other side, from my understanding of this, they it works around a lot of data. Yep. You know, some businesses might not have maybe the sufficient amount of data or, do you, yep. or is that um, a misconception that some Can people be. think that, you know, we don't have the scale of data as some of the bigger companies to be able to, one, yep. develop a model, but also, two, once we have developed this utility, do we have the economies of scales to make it economically efficient to say, you know what? We're going to deploy it in our three stores uh, and you'll be worthwhile. Or do I actually need the scale to be able to utilize it and find it as uh, as an efficient item to, to our business? Yeah, it's a great question. And and you, and you touched on the data aspect. Mm. I think in, in my time sort of advising large businesses and, and sort of traditional businesses on their sort of AI roadmaps, um, that is the first thing they say. They normally say, I don't think we have enough data. Mm -hmm. And then they say, I don't think our data is good enough. That's the, that's, the, that's the space they come from. And what we find is you actually don't need masses of data for, for AI to be able to help sort of enhance human decision making. Um, so, so first of all, there's a, there's a kind of a mis, misnomer around how much data is needed. And I couldn't give you a, a specific amount of data right now because it depends on each use case, right? There's, okay. there's a variety. Um, the, the other thing I would say is like, it, it depends. I think we need to just categorize businesses into two sectors. You've got digital native businesses. So a great example of that would be somebody like a fast fashion retailer like ASOS, okay. who grew up in the, in the, in the days where the elder data was in a cloud. Um, and basically they don't have any stores and everything's online. So they're going to amass lots and lots of data and they're going to be very savvy and they're going to be very um, good at implementing change to how they interact with customers because it's all online. So that's kind of like digital natives. And then you've got traditional businesses. So if we, if we use retail as the same example, you could have, I don't know, Primark. Right, who actually don't have, I don't think, an online presence. Everything's done through the, the shops. So there's, there's different requirements and different considerations need to be made for those different types of businesses, even though they're in the same industry sector. Okay. And, and basically, as we were just talking about earlier, the, the, the advice and the way that these businesses roll out successful projects is small steps, do a, do a pilot, do one store, do one type of product, see if you can get a sort of iterative sort of uh, increments to performance and then scale it out large. Um, but you don't need to be a large company to get the benefit of AI. Um, a lot of the digital native businesses are starting with very few customers, um, no stores, and they're already seeing uplifts in, in revenue when they apply AI for things like personal shopper recommendations or being able to predict who's going to return a product. Um, how to do sort of one hour delivery time slots. AI is at the heart of all these decisions for the small and very large businesses. So, but, but, and and for, for, most, for most projects, particularly where there's low levels of data, ingesting data sets from the internet or yeah. from other sources, okay. you know, is, is, it, is, it, is a key. And really that's what's happening with ChatGPT. So, mm. um, you know, the new age of companies who are starting to uh, run applications which have got ChatGPT at the heart of them, the really good ones that are very investable are the ones using their data, putting it into ChatGPT because it gives you that kind of unique USP and that IP. Um, but, but using other people's data, using publicly facing data to enrich your data sets is, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a key strategy that most small companies should adopt. What are some of the entry budgets uh, for usable utilities that you're seeing in SMEs so that we kind of demystify what it looks like in terms of putting an investment into the space? Mm. And again, without dodging the question, mm. depends on the use case because most technology now has an AI feature in it. Sure. So a great yeah. example would be um, a lot of SMEs use a, a, a CRM platform called HubSpot. 
uh, which is free. You can actually have so many users on it for free. That now has AI capabilities built into it. So okay. there are companies allowing you to deploy AI decision-making in tooling that they give away for free. So this isn't a question of, if you've, got, if you've not got a million pounds, don't come and talk to us. Like AI is going to be embedded in most new technologies that's, that's out there today that you can use with, with little or no budget. Yeah, I mean we're we're a we're a fund, right? So we're a we're in a we're a venture capital fund uh, called Fund AI, with the North's first dedicated artificial intelligence fund. And Martin's right, you know, it is actually quite cheap, quick, and easy to implement ChatGPT into your websites and into your workflows. I'm not necessarily certain we might invest in businesses that are, that are, that are at that kind of basic level of integration. Where we get really excited is companies who are using their data to integrate into ChatGPT or they've started on their data science journey and they've built their own algorithms. Building that IP through, um, through, through, through data is where we get interested from, a, from an investment perspective. But if you're not looking for investment and you want to make rapid, um, immediate strides, implementing through APIs, ChatGPT and you know, some, some, some of the other um, open AI platforms, is, it can be quick and easy and, and relatively cheap. Okay, so what are some of the downsides of AI? We talked a lot about ChatGBT. Yeah. Half of the time when I'm looking at some of the data within our own company and I'm maybe trying to upload it onto ChatGBT, and I'm thinking this is a bit sensitive, but um, <laughs> if I put it out there, am I putting it out into the big wide world technically that if anyone could have the right prompt? They could extract the information. How does it work, especially from an IP position uh, in protecting your, you know, the, the, the business secrets that make you more competitive out there while you're putting it into technically what is a, a learning system that is also spewing out the same information you feed it? Yeah, mm. there's a couple of angles on that, really. You touched on two things. You touched on data privacy and you touched on yeah. protection of IP. So from a data privacy perspective, I think something we always forget that the majority of the data we use in our own businesses is stored on a cloud platform somewhere else by somebody else, right? Okay. And that, that's, AI is not changing that. So first of all, the data privacy laws and governance is typically run by one of the big global tech players like an Amazon, a Google, a Microsoft. So first of all, we've been doing that for years. AI has not changed that. That, that, that footprint. From an IP perspective, if you are uploading your data into a cloud-based technologies and ChatGPT is one of those, and other people are sort of, you know, querying certain things, your, your data will be secure. You'll be anonymized and you will not have your trade secrets issued back out through ChatGPT. I mean, that, that's one of the beauties of it, as I understand. Like, it's not going to specifically reference your business and say, um, Michael's business did this, that, and the other, and therefore this is what you should do. You, you know, the data is anonymized um, from, from that perspective. Yeah, I mean, there was a massive shift in um, data security in, in the UK about eight years ago when the NHS got hit with WannaCry. I don't know if you remember, but the, the new, you know, all the national news channels had data security as the opening story because effectively the NHS got shut down. And that completely revolutionized the way that every large, medium, and small company thought about data security. Um, and, you know, implementing information security policies or putting in the right antivirus software or protecting anti phishing. I mean, that's just basic standards, ways of, ways of um, running, running um, well governed businesses. Um, but, you know, equally, Early stage companies like to move fast, and sometimes some of those things get 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 forgotten about. I mean, I'm a real data geek, mm -hmm. and uh, implementing those those kind of those kind of data security policies that's kind of set your business up 101 kind of strategies. Um, so yeah, I mean, there are many businesses who are potentially hearing about AI and potentially business owners and entrepreneurs listening to this podcast right now thinking, you know, that's a lot of tech. I'm not into tech. Yes. Uh, and the reality of it, if we look back uh, mm. a few years ago, we had, let's say, Blockbusters, you know, which was the biggest video rental company out there. Yeah. And they dominated the space. Yeah. Uh, they did not in, you know, look at streaming as a viable part, uh, platform or rather really invest in it. And now mm. they're non-existent. 
and this will probably be the case for a lot of businesses who do not get onto this particular wave of thinking and investment around AI or implementing even basic chat GBT for certain items. Mm-hmm. What are some of the uh, the key actionables you would say to every SME should be thinking of doing as of today from listening to this podcast? What should they, what are the three things uh, from each one of you that they should be actioning straight away so that they don't become the blockbuster of their industry? Yeah. So off the bat, if you want me to go first, Dave, I think the first thing yeah. you need to do is embrace this. AI is not going to disappear uh, in the next few years. And I, so I would encourage anybody that's running any any business of their own to really embrace what AI is at a sort of a high level, just so you feel comfortable talking about it. I think we see too many people seeing it as some kind of like secret source that they can't touch and they don't want to, they feel like it's a mysterious thing that they don't, they, it's not for them. You know, it's like too futuristic. It's not, it's here. As Dave touched on, it's been around since the 1940s. Um, just a, a reference point on that, like General Motors implemented the first robotic um, automotive platform in 1961. This stuff's been around, right? But it's going to yeah. get mainstream, so embrace it. Um, number two is don't don't focus on the tech, focus on what is it you're trying to improve. Um, that would be the the, the the second biggest thing. And then the third thing is have an honest discussion with yourself around where are you on an AI maturity scale? So if you're like terrified of it and don't understand it, you're going to need help. So it's like best to find people that can come in and help you. There are lots of consultancies that can help you get to where you need to be. On the other hand, if you're like very advanced and you've got a digital native business and you feel very comfortable with it, you're probably in a position where you can start to use some of the technologies to build bits of your own platform out. Um, But yeah, that would be my three really. Embrace would be the the number one. Yeah. And, and, you know, just again, Michael, I'm a real data geek. (laughs) and over the last 10, 15 years, I've seen loads of companies looking for investment. The ones that are super, super interesting for me and lots of private equity and VC firms are ones where the management team recognize the value of that data set. So, um, you know, lots of companies come for investment and they want to spend it on marketing or they want to spend it on the sales team. Uh, they might have a lot of data mm-hmm. and people like me and Martin might come along and say, look at this great asset you've got. You know, this is going to drive your multiple arbitrage. It's going to drive your valuation if you can create deep IP out of it. Some businesses don't care. They don't want to. They want to, they want to continue their sales strategy. And that is fine because that's the business that they've got. That's the strategy they've got. That's their growth, growth strategy. Finding companies that have got a lot of data where the management team recognizes the value from a VC perspective. Yeah. Wow, that's super interesting. That is super. We're all looking for that. We're all looking for those sorts of businesses. <laughs> so now let, let's turn the conversation then now from the entrepreneur and the business owner to the investor, because right. there are people out there who are saying, okay, I've heard this story before. Um, Bitcoin was yeah. there a few years ago. Uh, the crazy friends that was around it. Yeah. After that, we had NFTs, a new technology, uh, a new phenomena, uh, valuations, outpaced reality in terms of utility. And yep. you have some people who have <laughs> spent about 200,000 on diddly dots, you yeah. know, because they're supposed to be worth something. Yeah. Yeah. And they're now hearing, you know, come again with AI. Not no. Uh, you it's know, not- so, so, so what is the process of approaching this so that that one, first of all, the market hype always outpaces sometimes the general reality, even yeah. if there is a good utility. To the technology, what should be investors be doing right now as they now come out of the pains of potentially being yeah. burnt from those two uh, particular investments I've mentioned into going into AI? I I, I don't think AI is new. I think ChatGPT, the, uh, the the pop news of ChatGPT and large language models and OpenAI has driven a fervor around investors to get to get into what they think are AI businesses. I mean, we've been working in AI for 10 years or so. Yeah. It's not new. Mm. You know, we've been implementing algorithms into companies for, you know, five, six, seven years. And uh, I think there'll be a, an almost settling back down of, um, of, of data-led business investments. Um, Again, what, what, what we kind of look for is companies who, who have incredibly interesting data sets that can do lots of different things, that can do lots of different things with them. But, you know, to use your kind of analogy of um, NFTs um, and Bitcoin, it's a completely different technology. I see how that kind of has driven lots of interest and lots of news and lots of, 
you know, from an AI perspective, lots of kind of worries that um, you know it's going to take all of our jobs and it's and it's and it's going to uh, um, it's it, robots are going to kill us. Right. Uh, I think at some point that's going to settle back down again and we'll get back to business as normal. And to your point about valuation, I think very definitely ChatGPT has started to drive back up technology valuations where companies are starting because every company has an AI company right it's we, we I'd rarely see a company that doesn't doesn't reference artificial intelligence and our job is to be able to diligence them to work out whether or not uh, this is um, a real AI company it's got real data or not um, but from a valuation perspective I think valuations have definitely gone up as a result of artificial intelligence. Um, this time last year, there was a recalibration of technology company valuations. They were going to go, they, they started to go back down again, um, largely driven by macroeconomics and you know Ukrainian war and uh, crashes on the Nasdaq over 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 in the USA. But artificial intelligence has very definitely started to drive drive those those valuations back up. Um, and I think what where we come in. Uh, so our fund is a northern-based fund looking at artificial intelligence in the north. We think we, up here in the north, have an opportunity to invest in sensible AI valuations okay. just because there's, there's a bit of underfish waters going on. 60% of most investment into AI happens in Cambridge and, uh, and, and, and in, in the south and in London. We've got some fantastic AI businesses up here in the north and valuations are still very sensible. Can I just add to that, yeah, actually? Sure. So I think there's a couple of things you touched on. I agree totally with Dave, clearly on the NFT, cryptocurrency versus AI, like new new technologies that nobody can understand, not even me, Like, yeah. and, and I work in tech, as to how they're actually going to drive like incremental value that I can actually bank. I see all these lofty valuations, but I've not met anybody that's made money out of those sectors, like nobody. Yeah. I've met a lot of people that have lost money, nobody's made. In AI, totally different kettle of fish. I can, I can cite hundreds of businesses whose growth trajectory and sort of how much sort of their business is, is now worth is down to them using artificial intelligence. I know hundreds of investors in, in AI over the last 10 years who've made sizable returns. Dave and I have been investors in the sector for over 10 years. Uh, we've made we've made returns from like making some smart investments. This stuff is real. So there's, there's two different things. The only point I want to just touch on is when we talk about valuations, um, there's, there's two things to consider. Like what's going on in Silicon Valley is very different to what's going on in the UK. <laughs> so in Silicon Valley, and this is a lot of the stuff we read in the press, there's crazy AI valuations and there's money being sprayed around with little diligence because they've got big funding pots. Sure. We are at the opposite end of that in the UK, and we're even further away from that in the north, as Dave pointed out, because we operate a fund that is dedicated to AI that isn't the biggest fund in the world. So our diligence that we have to put into these businesses is greater. So all the startups we meet in these businesses say, your diligence is far harder than anybody else we've ever met at any time because we want to invest in, in great businesses. And at the heart of great business is the basics, great founding team, solving a problem that really matters in a market that's really big enough. Oh, and it uses AI to help them get there faster. That's the way we look at these companies versus they've got a new shiny tool that nobody else has got. Let's plow a load of money in and cross our fingers. So um, yeah, market's very different between the US and the UK. Yeah, and I think I think the other thing to say is we're, we're not hunting unicorns. No. <laughs> so, you know, back in the kind of boom and bust days of uh, venture capital tech, you know, everyone's got to be a unicorn. We're not investing in, in you unless, unless you're a unicorn. We've deliberately tried to discourage that idea for a couple of reasons. First of all, it actually really hurts management teams sometimes when they've been invested in and their investor is saying, right, we need you to be worth a billion dollars. We need you to be a unicorn. That, that can put in a massive amount of strain on, on founders. I think all we want to try and encourage and find are businesses that are just good businesses. Mm -hmm. They're going to get to profit quickly. They're going to give us potentially 10 times uh, returns on our investments. Um, they're just good companies and they're, and they're using artificial intelligence as a basis for that. And there are so many of, that, so many of those in the North that are, un, that are unloved by, by London-based VCs, which is why they've set up the fund. Yeah. Good stuff. So let's talk about then if I'm a retail investor, uh, intelligent investor, I have a pot of money. 
And I'm trying to understand, okay, how do I get in? Uh, I'm not overly hyped about, about the, the the crazy friends, but yeah. I'm, I'm a sensible individual person yeah. who wants to get involved in the space because I recognize the true utility value. Yeah. What am I doing? Because at the moment, I know uh, NASDAQ, I know uh, FTSE yeah. 100. Yeah. Uh, I can go on there. I have my matrix, which I've used for years, which have been used for years as well. Yeah. What am I doing to move me forward and get me invested in this space? you got two options, really. Mm. You can go directly and invest in a company as an angel. Okay. Uh, or you can invest in a fund. Um, we, we kind of meet lots of potential investors who have historically invested directly in companies. Do you mind explaining just the fund option as well? Because of course. So <laughs> some people are not familiar with the concept yeah. of, you know, what is a fund and how does it work? Sure. So, so we... Um, so a fund is a fund manager who has a certain amount, certain amount of investment cash uh, under management to invest in a series of different series of different companies. Um, fund AI, which is the fund that, that, that we work in, look to invest every year in four to five artificial intelligence companies, and uh, the life of that fund. It's what's called an evergreen fund, which means we're constantly raising and potentially there's no end to it. But as we model our fund, there's maybe five years worth of uh, investment um, um, into artificial intelligence companies. So if we're doing four investments every year, four times five is 20. Uh, we're looking to invest in 20 northern artificial intelligence companies. And um, each fund... Um, each different fund manager's fund will have a series of different kinds of attributes. So we're what's called an EIS fund, the Enterprise Investment Scheme. The, Ent the Enterprise Investment Scheme was set up by the government uh, to encourage uh, angels and high net worth people and entrepreneurs to invest in early stage companies. And as a result, you get, a, you get um, certain tax breaks. So for every pound that you invest into a company, you get 30 pence back. There's a 30% there's a tax break. What, are, what, what, we, what we are doing as a fund is helping those angels and high net worths to, fight, to, to use all of our skills, our expertise, our history, um, our, our resources to find and diligence the best possible investments for people that wish to invest in the fund. So, you know, Martin and I will, and uh, the rest of the management team will, will, will spend time originating companies. We will go and attend events. We deliver thought leadership. We have companies coming to us because they've heard about Fund AI. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll work out whether or not it's, it's, a, it's a good investment for the fund. As an investor, why um, sometimes it's best um, in uh, investing in a fund as opposed to an individual company is because you get that kind of um, asset expertise. So we're, we're experts in artificial intelligence. If you're an investor and you wish to get into the AI space, you might not know what to look for, how to dilig diligence it, how to find these companies. And what we're doing as a fund is we're, we're doing all that research work. We're using our expertise to be able to identify the best possible companies for the highest possible return. So looking at the broader markets, how can one uh, identify companies that are really at the forefront of uh, AI and invest in them in the conventional way? Yeah, sure. So if you, we're talking about public markets, um, it's investing in, in AI businesses is no different to any other business. So you're looking at like, you're basically looking at um, market share, what they have today, the market availability, the total addressable market they can grow into, uh, what the competitors look like. Um, there, there is nothing different about investing in an AI company that you would invest in a, a retailer. The the only thing that we we could add to that to sort of flower to, to add another dimension, I guess, mm. would be if you were looking at, uh, for example, um, businesses that have an AI storage component, so they're storing lots and lots of data for other AI companies. Now you can kind of make a decision that there's going to be a big demand for that because mm. more and more people are going to be storing more and more AI images. So therefore you think their market, their market sort of total addressable market is huge. So there's just, you've just got to apply a little bit of logic. I guess I'm, uh, I'm waffling a little bit, Michael, because there is no difference in how you would go about sure. investing in an AI company versus a retailer or an automotive business or a finance company. It's the fundamentals of, of investing. No. I, th I think, I think the, the only thing I'd add to that is whether or not those companies have got any IP in them. Okay. So, um, you know, 
again, creating IP and product from data uh, just drive, dri drives valuation. And if, if you're an investor and you're looking to invest you know, on the stock markets and you're really interested in, in, in investing in the AI space, always look for that IP, always look for that um, USP around, around, around product. And I guess linked to that, which I think the point you're, you're making on products, if you're thinking about the scalability of an AI company, its limiting factor for scale is how many people it takes to deploy their technology. So if you look at a, a, an AI-listed business, you'd want to understand the split of revenues they enjoy from pure product through to services. And the companies yeah. that have the greater percentage of product versus services, you could argue have a greater chance of scaling and being more sort of capital efficient. That would be probably the only thing to add. Oh, great stuff. Maybe I, SaaS? Yeah. Yes. Now, I think you certainly have demystified because ultimately that's what we're trying to do here, to get the average person to kind of... Mm go beyond the headlines and understand that, okay, no, these are still companies. You still have to look at them in the same way that you would do to any company and actually yeah. say, how are they deploying it? Yeah. Do they have a real use case? Or is it just an AI wrap around to just inflate valuation, but without yeah. necessarily having any fundamental yeah, yeah. impact yeah. to their company? Now, we'll continue this conversation on Wealth Chronicles. In a recent interview uh, by the British Prime Minister with Elon Musk, uh, Musk went on to make a very bold statement to say that there will come a time where no job is needed. That statement means different things to different people. Uh, business owners would take it from a perspective of less headcount, but the, the reality is that the majority of people will look at it as a threat to their very existence and livelihood. What, what's your take on that statement, first of all, in terms of how realistic is it and how far are we f from that particular age? Uh, I think artificial intelligence is potentially the start of the next industrial revolution. Um, and I think with all industrial revolutions, there's inevitably, first of all, a fear factor, which is what we're going through now. And secondly, there's a recalibration of the way that people work, which potentially will have an impact on jobs, potentially. Um, I'm old enough to remember the world before the internet. And I find that hard to believe, Dave. Thank you very much. <laughs> I've been moisturising. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I, I, I'm old enough to remember a similar mm. um, period in time where technology was potentially going to take away all of our jobs, and it's called the internet. Uh, my first job, uh, I worked in a shipyard. I ha I, when I worked in a shipyard, I couldn't possibly imagine the society that we now live in. Uh, with almost every single job and company on the planet using the internet. It's been the opposite. It's created jobs, it's created new societies, it's created entrepreneurs, it's created different ways of living, <clears throat> most of which are um, massive advancements for society. So my view is that, um, yes, it's going to have an impact on society, and I think it's within our gift to make that impact better for society rather than worse. Um, imagine a world where repetitive jobs uh, where, um, are replaced through automation. Imagine a world where our children um, don't work necessarily on their own in a, in a, in a little lonely store in the rain uh, because um, that's now been automated. You know, imagine a world where we have more time for the arts, for relaxation. Uh, that's the world I would like to live in, and I think that's that's the type of world that artificial intelligence will help us will help us to achieve. Um, the the stuff that's going on last week with Elon Musk and Rishi Shunak, um, Sunak um, uh, thinking about how how to legislate for artificial intelligence, I think is really important. Um, we need to, we need we need to we need to control what artificial intelligence will do, but as human beings. We're able to do that, and we should be able to do that. Um, I mean, you know, talk, 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 talking about the Prime Minister and talk, talk, talking about um, what central government are doing around artificial intelligence, you know, the, 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 the UK government predicts that AI will contribute £880 billion to the UK economy over the next, over the next five years, that we're going to spend something like £220 billion on artificial intelligence. That feels like it's going to create jobs. And just back to, you know, what are people doing when they come out of university? <clears throat> um, if you're a mathematician, 
your and this is a very small example, right, of sure. what of what of what what could happen. If you're if 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 you did a maths degree, typically your career path was going to be an accountant or a teacher. Um, you know the 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 world of job employment for people who have got um, scientific, mathematician type degrees and qualifications into artificial intelligence, the ecosystem that needs to that needs to go behind that has just kind of massively opened up. Mm. Okay. Can I just cut to yeah, on sure. the sort of Elon quote because I, I saw that as well, and I'm always interested in people's motivations for for like saying quite like provocative things like that. And you could argue that one of the reasons why Elon Musk is is kind of like you might call it scaremongering is that his technology empire is falling behind on the AI race and he's trying to implement legislation that will slow the development of AI down so they can play catch-up. Mm. Um, that's what some of his competitors are saying. Okay. I noticed he's launched his own uh, competitive product, ChatGPT, this week. Yeah, is it Greco? Grok, Grok I think. Is Grok, it Grok? Yeah. Um, but just coming back to some, some stats, I read something about... Because um, employment, yeah, the, the employment landscape is going to change, as Dave said. Mm. Um, new jobs are going to exist that don't. Other jobs, we're going to coexist side by side with AI to sort of make ourselves more efficient. But there was two stats I read this week from Forbes. Um, one was that um, 25% of all the companies in the US are deploying AI to fix a labor shortage problem. So there are jobs that exist today that mm-hmm. there are openings for that nobody wants to do anymore. Like they just, and I don't know what's happened. I think since COVID happened, and particularly in the UK since Brexit, there's been a change in people's attitudes towards work. So AI can help fix some of the sort of more mundane sort of tasks. Um, the other stat from Forbes, which I thought was really cool, that over the next five years, AI itself is expected to create 97 million new jobs. So it isn't like all doom and gloom. Yep. We should, when we look at like, quotes from people like Elon Musk, we should counterbalance it with like, what are others saying and like, what are the stats to back some of this up? So summary Mm. is jobs will change. Will, will we all get wiped out by robots and robots do all the jobs? (laughs) Absolutely not. Um, But some of the more sort of mundane tasks are already being automated. I think that's a great point around the job creation. And I think the other thing I'd say is, I mean, we see loads of companies that are tech for good. Mm. You know, they're companies that are working in agri-tech. You know, the world, the world's going to run out of food potentially at some point or it's, you know, and we, we, we are looking at companies who are working out ways of fixing that by using artificial intelligence. And we see lots of health tech companies that are trying to, that are trying to cure metabolic um, health problems or diabetes or yep. mental health problems, all using artificial intelligence. You know, the, the, the tech for good element, and you're right, you know, the amount of jobs it's going to create potentially is going to be huge. And the tech for good element is something that we need to embrace and encourage. Okay, let's dive deeper into this because there is a reality also that really comes in with AI because ultimately, as a business owner, looking at it internally as well, you're looking at the analyst you would have hired in yesteryear. Chat GBT is doing the analytical work at any time. Is mm-hmm. some of we, it, we would argue no, that. it's not. <laughs> so, 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 for, for some people, it is, mm-hmm. it, depending on the complexity of their area of work. There is an administrator who would have proofread a number of emails and, you know, rejigged the, the, the document a number of times mm-hmm. whereby you would have needed three of them because of the size of your operation. But now <laughs> Chat GBT can give you five versions of a, you know, mailing campaign, et cetera, et cetera. So, Let's talk more about that individual worker now. Yeah. Uh, where, what should they be doing? Because there is a reality that if it's not going to replace the job, it is going to certainly reduce the need of the headcount of the jobs that are currently existing in some of the sectors, mm-hmm. especially when you talk about, let's talk, look at our average Tesco. You used to go to Tesco and you would have cashiers on every checkout. Yeah. But now you can go out Self-service, yep. which means that half of the jobs on the checkout have gone. So what are we saying then to that individual? How can they prepare themselves for this age so, moving forward? Yeah. So in the UK, mm. there are a million job vacancies within grocery stores. Why, why do we know that? Mm. Because one of our investments uh, is, is in that area, and it's using artificial intelligence to, um, first of all, solve that problem, Um to solve the problem of um, great customer service using, using artificial intelligence, um, and you know just just to make to make the experience of shopping much better. 
Okay. So uh, you, you, you're right. When you, when you think about, well, AI is going to take a load of jobs away in grocery, actually the reality is, and we know this because we diligence this area, there's a massive skill shortage in some areas that artificial intelligence can, can solve. But also for me, you touched, you, made, mm. you touched on two things there. You touched on the use case of a retailer and self-checkout, and you also mentioned analysts. Mm. So just if I start with the analysts first, um, the large proportion of an analyst, so an analyst is like a highly skilled person mm. that can make sense from data, that gets mm. paid a reasonable salary and is well mm. thought off within an organisation. Um, they spend the bulk of their time wrangling, so I'm going to put it in terms of messing mm. about with data, trying okay. to get data in the right tables, in the right format, ingesting data into systems, and spend so little time on actually doing analysis that they're brilliant and trained to do. AI will help them spend more time on doing proper analysis um, because AI will take care of the data wrangling and all the sort of like messing about, as I called it, in the in the sort of back end. Okay. So actually, like we, we speak to the analyst community quite a lot and the advances in tech is now making them like more valuable inside businesses, not less, okay. because they're getting to use their superpower. In the same way, no, I don't go off on a tangent. If you look at healthcare sectors, like to be trained to become a doctor is really hard. And it's, what is it, seven, eight, nine years? Yeah. You do not want to come out of a seven, eight, nine years of training to spend your first three years looking at, um, looking at X-ray images all day in a dark room. You want to be sat in front of patients. Yeah. So AI can take care of, we'll read all the X-ray images for you. We'll tell you which ones need attention so you can deliver better patient care to your patients. So what I'm saying is a lot of these jobs won't disappear. You'll just get to spend more time doing the thing that you actually trained for in the analyst and the, and the doctor's case. Back to retail. Um, my personal point of view is the worst part of any retail experience in grocery is the paying of the checkout, right? Not, my kids haven't grown up to, they, none of them or their friends sort of say, when I leave college, I'm going to go and work on a checkout. Like people end up in those jobs probably because they can't think of any other alternative or it's like a, a, a means to an end. What we're seeing in retail is a couple of things that they've touched on. Sort of autonomous stores are going to be the, 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 the they are happening. They're going to be here. So mm. self-checkout is terrible. Um, you're going to be able to walk into stores, put things in your pocket, your bag, walk straight back out and be billed instantly. That already exists today. That is going to become mainstream. The people that were actually in those stores working on checkouts have actually been redeployed into customer service. So when you're walking around a store and you're lost, or you don't know something or you have somebody saying, hey, Dave, or hello, you know, would you like to try? We've got a coffee brand on this week that you might be interested in. It's all down to customer care. So they're being redeployed to do less menial jobs that are more fulfilling um, and like and solve a problem which is terrible customer service. Okay, I mean this yeah. program is about taking proactive action yeah. uh, regarding your own destiny, your finances, and your own well-being. So give me some actionables then for the employee who is looking mm -hmm. at this from that perspective that there is this new wave of technology. Am I waiting for me to be repositioned to do that particular job? Or what am I doing for myself to make sure that, one, I am ready for this new industrial revolution? Yep. I am skilled. What am I skilling myself in? So that that way I'm much more, how can I say, valuable to a business in the age of AI. Cool. If it, if it was me, right? So it, it is me. Like, no matter what job you do, go onto the internet and just Google, how can I help, my, help me in my job role? Like literally, it's, it's as simple as that. Um, I'll give you a great example. Using ChatGPT, you're saying? You can put it into Google, you can put it into ChatGPT, but okay. like, where would AI help me like be more efficient at my job would be a great question to okay. ask your peers, the internet, ChatGPT. Um, and, and like, if I go back to my early career, um, I daydreamed as a, as a young man to get into sales because I thought I really want to spend my time driving around the country because I like driving and I like being free. And I want to sit in front of people, talking to them and trying to sell them things. And I had this wonderful vision. Do you know how many hours a week I actually spent sat selling in front of people of every week was five. The rest of my time was spent in a dark room in Leeds, trying to understand who I should be talking to, trying to get their telephone numbers, trying to like basically get those appointments. In sales, if I was like my younger self now, and I was like, how do I use AI to make myself more efficient? It would say, use AI to prospect, use AI to send emails, use AI, you know, and suddenly that ratio of five hours a week would become 10, 15, 20. It would work for me. I'd earn more money as a salesperson. It would work for my 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 employer because they would <clears throat> make more money out of me as well. So just really simple first mm. step. Just just educate yourself and understand how your your role can be made more efficient. David, from a from a technical point of view, yeah. uh, I've seen some training around learning how to prompt. Um, you know, so that, Stay that off way. the internet. <laughs> <laughs> 
so that you can uh, you better utilize the you know AI for whatever utility case you need. What, what's your what's your thinking around in terms of maybe CPD from employers or for from a personal point of view to better use this technology? Yeah, and there's lo- there's loads of online courses that you can that you can use. Um, I mean, I, I'm I'm a techie, and technology moves really quickly, mm. and sometimes you just got to stay on top of technology by you know you, you go onto YouTube and find some fantastic resources to help mm. you to understand how to um, how to become proficient at data. Um, you know how, how how to use spreadsheets. Even you know it, there's, there's there's so many different resources that you can use. I um, uh, even at my ripe old age, I still like to learn new technical things. So I like to learn new computer languages and, you know, there are free or very cheap and easy uh, online training programs that you can go, that you, that you can go and use to, to work out how to, how to become a techie, you know, how to become a programmer, how to become a data scientist. Uh, and these are really rewarding careers, you know, you great money, get to meet some great people. You work across all sorts of different uh, industries and sectors. Um, and if, if, I could, if I could sort of teach a young me mm. uh, a, few, a few little skills, it would be, you know, don't be too scared about technology. It's actually not that hard. You can demystify it quite quickly. There's loads of fantastic resources you can use to go online to work it out. Well, we talk about training then. Uh, we, we're in an age whereby everyone can realize the issues around our education system. That first of all, sometimes it's not fit for purpose. As employers, we're getting people who are coming through that system who are not ready for work. Yeah. Um, if our education system is not even ready for our world as it is today, how much more of a challenge does it have for the future world that's coming? So as a parent or someone who might have nieces or nephew. What's your thinking around what the, the education pathway for your own kids? What should they be doing? Or what are you now doing maybe in addition to that uh, maybe school placement that they are going to? Or have you totally turned around and say, you know what? <laughs> now you're coming out of school. We're homeschooling. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Church EPT, we don't care. No, no. Uh-huh. Um, so I, I've got two kids. My youngest has just gone to university, actually. So I'm very like, this is very familiar territory for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and she didn't, like most 18-year-olds, know what she wanted to do. So there's a couple of things, really. Good old-fashioned parents in around like what is it you enjoy where do you want to be talk talk about the sort of jobs you're interested in and then if if as a as a like a more experienced elder person we can see that those jobs are not going to be the same as what she thinks they are today it was just a question of like look i'll give you some education on like what you need to be thinking about because that that job role is going to change but where's technology is concerned we had a real life example of this last week um she was sat in our kitchen home for a reading week doing some, she was writing stuff out and I said, what are you doing? She's like, oh, I'm just collecting all my my sort of like notes from lectures. And I said, are these lectures online or are they physical? She said, well, some of them are online. I said, so what are you doing? Handwriting all the notes out. I was like, yeah, you don't need to do that. It's a piece of technology called Fireflies, yeah. which you can just pop into the, pop up into the thing and it will take all your notes for you and it'll pull out all the salient points and it'll summarize. So she's like, oh my God, this will like really, really speed up my efficiency. So it's like, so it's two things, looking at the future jobs, but also making sure they're using technologies today that can really help them become as efficient as, and as good as they can. It's kind of like what I've done. Um, but the, the last point I would say is, I think you asked quite a big question there because, uh, you know, you could argue that the education system is like not fit for purpose mm-hmm. for a variety of different reasons. Um we actually work with a really great business called SpringPod, mm. um, who's based in Liverpool, mm. and they they enable people or children from disadvantaged backgrounds to get those opportunities that that you, they probably would think are not there. Um, so they're using technology to match make great companies that are looking for these people that don't quite know how to reach them, and the great people that don't know, think the opportunities exist to kind of match make them up. So again, another example of how tech is is helping in the education system. Yeah, it, it'll mm. be interesting to see mm. how UK schools do adopt artificial intelligence to support um, to support learning. I, I mean, the UK right is the third biggest artificial intelligence superpower on the planet. Behind China, 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 and, China, and, China yeah. and USA, yes. it's it's the biggest European superpower uh, for AI, and the government are pumping in enormous amounts of resources into artificial intelligence and encouraging <coughs> the entire country to 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 to, to adopt AI. And I think it's, it's going to find its way through to education, no no question. I, the, the way I think about it is, you know, I'm at school to learn. I'm not at school to be using chalk or to be using a tablet. You know, I'm at school to learn. And if AI can help people to do that because it speeds up resources, it speeds up training, as Martin says, you know, it gives you 
it gives you those supplementary support tools to learn, then then fantastic. Okay, then. So to close it off, uh, give us your vision of how AI could transform the world in the next five to 10 years yep. and what gets you excited the most. I think what gets me excited the most, there are, there are, there's one major thing and then there's one minor thing, which is a bit selfish, so we'll go on to that last. So the, the major thing is the advancement in drug discovery. Um, there, there are so many great companies out there that are using AI and what they're doing is they're, they're ingesting everything we know about every disease, everything we know about every drug trial, and they're using it to make sense faster to be able to, to release new drug patents. Like for me, that is, if you said to me, you can use AI for one thing and one thing only, that would be it. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing it works. There's a br- superb um, uh, London headquarter business called Benelevant AI. That's exactly what they do. So for me, the advancement in, in sort of solving um, sort of very dangerous or, or, or like um, incurable diseases would be like the most exciting thing we're going to see a lot of in the next five years. From a personal selfish point of view, I just want to outsource all the tasks I hate, right? <laughs> so I want to ask Siri or Alexa to do all these things, to schedule my meetings, to book mm. these appointments, da, 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 da. And if you get, if I get a lawnmower that I felt comfortable with cutting the grass as well, you know, that, that's where I'd be. So just, <laughs> I want more time to enjoy myself, not doing tasks. Uh, yeah. Good, and what, what, what he said about, about health tech in particular but, I mean, we've been saying for years that, you know, human beings are going to have three-day working weeks. You know, we're going to have mm. more time for for the arts. We're going to have more time to enjoy ourselves. We're going to have more time to relax. Mm. We're going to replace monotonous jobs with more creative systems and processes and roles and enjoyment. That's what I hope AI brings to to us. No, I think I think it will. No, certainly. I think especially on the on the healthcare as well. I was I was listening to Nvidia's uh, podcast on my way here, uh, and it's one of those things where that the average person doesn't really realize in terms of the great impact that it has on identifying, you know, sort of like early stage yeah, yeah, diseases. Yeah. I think they were talking about, uh, a, a, you know, an eye condition that can cause someone who has diabetes to go blind. Yep. The natural eye can look at the scans at an early stage and not detect it. Yep. But AI is now able to look at all the, you know, yep. from using all the data sets from all the previous, you know, uh, patients to identify such uh, yeah. such such uh, such diseases early. No, it's been a great uh, conversation to understand how AI is really going to make an impact across industries, investments, and ultimately education and careers in the future. Thank you for taking time to be with Thanks, us Michael. today, Thank and you, uh, check out their details within the description of the video, and uh, make sure that you are staying ahead of the curve of the AI revolution. Thank you for watching uh, World Chronicles and remember to hit that like and subscribe button and we'll see you next time.